and could not be opened. It's not red. Are we live? It's hard to say. Good. Okay. And my field monitor going, that's up over there. What's going on, people? We are a streaming. We're a live streaming. Let's do this. Wait for this to catch up just a little bit. We've got Oscar Madison. How are we doing? We have got the Strippers Bill of Rights. Strippers, they're workers, they're employees. No, they're independent contractors, aren't they? They've got to have protections. Or is it that they're not financially feasible without booze? So we got to figure out a way to get from here to there and have some booze going on. Got to have some booze flying, coming on in. All right. Let me check a few things over here. Let me look at this stuff. I think we're good to go. Let's do this. I'm good, Oscar. I'm good. Thank you for asking. We're getting ready to go. All right. Here we go. Quick drink of water. Not booze. We're not boozing it up on news for reasonable people because that's not reasonable. I saw a, a lady down in Oregon. She runs kind of one of those, hey, here's what's going on in Oregon. She had a few glasses of wine one evening, decided to record something. Mm, not a good look. Not a good look as an adult. You're 21. You're on your 21 run. You record something, throw it up there to Instagram. That's okay. That's not what we're doing here. That's not, it's just not reasonable. All right. So here we go. Tristan. Let's start this bad boy. <laughs> the reason I am re <laughs> the reason I am reading this article is is in it's in the title. It's all in the title. Governor Inslee signed stripper, yes, strip stripper, bill of rights into law, paving way for alcohol sales. Hmm. Okay. So we're going to have worker protections in a strip club. People taking off their clothes, and then we're going to booze up the customers, and this is somehow going to be safer. All right, yeah, that's what we're doing in Washington State. That's literally what our fine governor has signed into law. Let's get into it. Here we go. It's so preposterous. This is, somebody was, uh, <laughs> coffee is reasonable. It is, and you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm drinking water. Not even, I'm not even, not even hitting the chemicals. Right, just doing some. <laughs> so I'm going to read a couple, a couple of paragraphs here, and then we're going to we're going to roll into it. New rules are coming to strip clubs that could make work conditions safer for dancers and eventually allow alcohol sales at these businesses. I mean, that right there to me is just what, what, what? Uh, worker protections and booze. Every other industry, work booze separated because it's a bad idea. It's a terrible idea. Drinking and driving, terrible idea. But somehow stripping and boozing, ah, this should work out fine. This will be good. All right, we can sell this. Governor Jay Inslee signed state, sent a state bill, whatever it is, 6105, into law on Monday. The legislation was sponsored by Senator Rebecca Saldana. We'll get to see her later. Um, and it requires a series of worker protections for dancers. All right, worker protections for dancers. All right, okay. Eliminates lewd conduct rules for establishments that serve alcohol. Eliminates, eliminates, does not create, eliminates. Get those out of here. Distance between customers, mm, yeah. but you, you can't have any funny business, but we're going to eliminate, you know, um, <laughs> the, whole, the whole thing is just right from the get go. You're all right. What's the point of this bill? Okay. Get booze into strip clubs because they're taking too much of a chunk from the strippers, uh, nightly, daily, whatever, 
they're charging them too much. They're independent contractors. They got to, you know, pay 150 bucks. It takes a big chunk out of their, their work day of, you know, showing the goods because they're workers and they need to have protections. This also creates a path for adult entertainment businesses to get liquor licenses. So, okay. Yeah. I'm still stumped on, you know, what we've got. I understand what we've got going on here, but how can you legitimately, why don't we just say, hey, strip clubs are not economically viable without booze in them. And then I'd be like, okay, all right. So you're going to give places where horned up men are going to be watching women take their clothes off and perform various whatever antics to, you know, keep the horned up, now boozed up, potentially wildly boozed up patrons. I'm sure that's going to work out fine. It'll work out fine. It'll, be, it'll just, just be good, right? Washington state is the only state in the United States that does not allow alcohol in its strip clubs. Huh? Yeah. How is, how is that possible? Portland. I haven't been to a strip club in Portland. I understand strip clubs in Portland. And that's one thing that we really haven't covered enough of because yeah, we just don't really cover strip clubs. Yeah. That whole thing. It's, it's just, it's not my thing. And it's, it's, it's quite frankly, it's not reasonable. Um, it just, it does, if, if you're into strip clubs, Hey, more power to you. If that's your thing. Okay. Not something that, um, that I'm into. I've been to a handful of strip clubs. I think four, I was trying to count for this podcast, how many I've been to two, when I just turned 18 novelty wore off, boom, done. Yeah. We're going to grow up. We're going to be adulting in a few years here. So uh, we're not going to do that. Once with my wife and her sister and brother-in-law, it was a family strip club affair. It was the Girls of Glitter Gulch in Las Vegas. And that was probably literally 25 years ago. And then another time after coming, another, another friend's wife said, hey, we got to go to a strip club. We were walking past the strip club after a uh, Jane's Addiction concert. And, um, I, you know, you know, happy wife, happy life kind of thing, I guess, ish. So 50% of my strip club activities have been because of women in my life. What are you going to do? What are you going to do, right? But this whole concept here, this idea that, <laughs> that we're, we're going to set up some safety protocols for the ladies, in, in this um, state bill 6105, there is no mention of male genitalia in the, the safety recommendations or whatever there. None. None. It's just it, it calls out only women's body parts. I think that's sexist. I think that's sexist, and we should look into that. I think that is not, DEI is not being applied there. It's, it's not inclusive. If you don't have inclusive language, then what are we even doing? Let's watch a little video. Let's watch. Now, I know you're going to have to grit your teeth and watch this, but um, it's what we're doing. All right. Let's watch a little video. Let me get going here. We're going to watch Jay Inslee. I'm going to make you watch Jay Inslee. Oh. This is what I'm working with in my state, people. You need to pray for me, right? And everybody else that's in Washington State. This is what we're working with. What is, what's going on here? What, what, what do we got going on there? Is, I mean, I'm, I'm just asking for a friend, right? Okay, yeah, this is, this is literally, this does not look like a group of strippers. I, yeah, no uh, random couple of dudes back here. Their wives or their girlfriends must have made him go. I mean, what guy is going to, you know, go for that other than Jay Inslee? All right, let's keep going. Ooh.
This is the, um, the state representative that uh, put this into place. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Extensive. Why are you wearing a mask? Oh, that's, that's, that's comforting. All right. They're going to get some protocol in place. They're going to, they're going to get some stuff going on that, um, it's, it's just going to make this a better experience. Now, this is Washington State. We have got a crazy fentanyl problem. We have got a crazy homeless problem. We have got crime just going crazy. Seattle's got crime. We've got human trafficking. We've got sex trafficking. We've got a known, known Aurora Avenue North in Seattle that is just hooker city all day long. Maybe I'm not supposed to say hooker. Prostitute, lady of the evening, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we've got these issues that, that are just known stated quantities. I don't see any of those folks getting protections. I don't, I don't really see this having a, it's going to have a positive impact somewhat from the ha standpoint of having, Hey, you're going to bring bouncers in. Okay. I'm all right with that. You didn't have to have bouncers at a strip club prior to this. I mean, it just sounds like a recipe for disaster. Has anybody seen the new Roadhouse? Yeah, it, it's terrible. Other than Jake, however you pronounce his last name, that guy is shredded for that movie. That guy is just not gay, but that guy was, he got in shape for that, that movie. And the original Roadhouse was, was way, way better. But um, I'm a Roadhouse fan. It's a great movie, just a great movie. But that's, uh, that's about, you know, a, um, a really, really unruly you know, bar has live music and you got to have, you got to have protection. How do you not have protection at a strip club? Uh, Washington state, right? We come up with these wacky backwards rules, you know, that don't make any sense at all. And then, ah, oh, yeah, let's throw in this angle so that we can get some, get some liquor sales going on, on in here. We'll make the uh, strip club viable plus State will get some tax revenue, some much needed tax revenue because we're not able to collect from all those businesses downtown because they're not there because we allowed homelessness and drug addicts to just run around. And we're not really incarcerating people. So, you know, the tax base has gotten just a little bit wonky here. So, hey, strippers, strippers, booze, this will be, be a great concept. It, it's been that way for, for most other states in the United States. I just find it funny that that Seattle is just now coming to it. Everything here is just so backwards. It's like, huh, okay, here's the angle, guys. We spin it as a safety bill, a safety bill, safety bill. But, all right, now one of the things we're going to do is we're going to eliminate that distance. We used to have at my high school, we had, I don't know, was it the six-inch rule? I think it was the six-inch rule. We, we didn't technically, I went to a Christian high school, we didn't technically have dances per se, and any kind of contact between boys and girls, you had to have the six inch rule of, of body contact, right? And you've got that in the strip clubs too as well. Because, um, you know, it's, you know, you just can't have that. We've eliminated that, but there's wording that says, uh, no funny business, no, no shenanigans here. We, we can't have that. Oh, we're going to focus on the safety. We're going to focus on this. We're going to focus on that. 
then we're going to slip in. But this article, clearly written by Como, who's conservative, <laughs> the title says it all. Stripper's Bill of Rights into Law Paving Way for Alcohol Sales. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, oh, oh, okay. All right. Yeah, it's what we're working with here, right? It's what we're working with here. With so many other things in our world, specifically here in the Pacific Northwest, I mean, we had CHOP, where two black kids got murdered. Yeah, but we're working on, on strippers, and we've only got a handful. We don't have a strip club game like Washington doesn't have a strip club game like um, Oregon or any other state. We've got very few strip clubs. Just, I don't know. I don't know why. Mainly because uh, prostitution just wide open. I mean, literally, 15-minute drive from here. You, you literally sit in your car and you will be, there's, there's ladies of the evening all around you. And they'll come up and they'll knock on your door. I mean, it's, you know, you don't have to go to them. They come to you. Um, <laughs> it's just, the whole thing is just crazy. So. Like Governor Inslee said, it's pretty simple why we're passing this bill. Yeah, because you need the revenue from the booze, right? Because booze, to, ladies, work with me here. All right, your job is to take off your clothes for strange, perverted men, right? That's your job. Now, throw in booze in there. Do you feel more comfortable? Uh, no. In no world does anybody feel comfortable dealing with another human being under the influence of anything let alone just now they can just sit and watch in, and drink up, you know? And then we spin it, which, which is normal in other states, but we're spinning this as, well, you know, the safety protocols. So here's from my fine governor. It's pretty simple why we're passing this bill. These are working folks and working people deserve safety in the environment in which they work, the governor said. Okay, all right. But is serving the patrons booze as part of this package, is that? Is that really, is that, is that really what's going on here? Yeah, no, it's just some virtue signaling and we're trying to get, because we're Washington State, we're so progressive. Progress, progress is bringing booze to, you know, the guys I talked about earlier. In preparing for this um, podcast, no, I did not go to a strip club. No, I did the next best thing. I called my buddy who owns two sports bars. Dan Flitch. And um, I said, now, why work me through why a guy in 2024 with all the porn you need on the internet, allegedly, allegedly, right? All the porn on the internet, why in 2024 are strip clubs still a thing? And he's like, uh, some guys just need to go in there and see it firsthand and have that experience. I'm like, okay, so you're going to see a girl that yeah, does that for a living might work on the side, most likely works on the side as, you know, providing additional services. You know, there's a, another bundle of services that she offers that are, you know, maybe in that back room, but um, more importantly, probably after hours. I don't know. And then you've got the whole, you got the whole OnlyFans thing now, right? You have private membership and you watch your girl and it's over the computer and, you know, you're not having to go into a club and spend a lot of money. Why are strip clubs still a thing? I, I, I never really, we never really got to the, the answer to that other than people want to do what they want to do. And some guys, that's just their thing is to exert their authority over girls taking their clothes off. Hey, it just, what are we doing? I don't know. So <laughs> Governor Inslee explained that. So Donna said the training requirements will be comprehensive. Oh, thank good. I was worried there. You're going to serve booze without comprehensive training requirements? Man, that would have been a shocker. That would have been a shocker. This, that is really critical to make sure people understand signs of trafficking, how to do de-escalation. All right, so these folks are going to be trained in de-escalation, okay? How much de-escalation are you going to have to do more now that you're adding booze in there? Mm, don't talk about that. That's yeah, don't go there. How to make sure they are creating a safe place for everyone. Strip clubs inherently are not safe for women. Period. Anybody else wants to say they are? Mm, I, I really disagree. I really disagree. It's, and, and maybe it's not on the premises, physical, but you hear those stories all the time. And it's just inherently, you've got built into this profession 
a certain level of danger and safety issues for the females because they are the smaller sex, right? I don't care what you say. Did you guys hear about, um, we just had a uh, brand new Planet Fitness go in Bellevue. They took over Crunch Fitness where I used to be a member. Planet Fitness, they got all the purple equipment. And um, there was a lady in Alaska who walked into her locker room in Planet Fitness and off in the corner was a 12-year-old uh, young lady. She was wearing a towel. She'd just gotten out of the shower. And at the sinks was a dude, a full-on dude, who was shaving. Who was shaving. The, the patron, the, the lady, and I'm guessing she's in her 60s. I don't know. Um, she said, yeah, I, re I reported this to the front desk. And uh, effectively, they canceled her membership because... Guys shaving in the women's locker room in Alaska at Planet Fitness is okay. That's all right. That's okay. Nowhere should that be a thing. You know, people are going to the gym to try and get healthy. They go in there and some dude's shaving. And he, he, would, he, he looked, you know, he, he wasn't even pretending that he was a woman. He was a straight up dude. Uh, you know, he's a guy. So, you know, it, it's one of those things where... That's threatening, right? Because men are bigger, stronger, women, not so much. That's just how it is. There's no way you can get around that, right? So it's really critical to make sure people understand signs of traffic. Okay, so that's another thing. You got so much trafficking going on now. I mean, it's, you're seeing signs of that all around you. And we've got it just wildly open here in, in Seattle. I mean, it is literally on the streets, on the sidewalks, Highway 99, 105th through call it 145th. That's 40 blocks. That's over three miles of stretch where you've got the opportunity, peel off, ah, I'll take her. You got to negotiate, obviously, but clubs that meet these new safety requirements will also be eligible to get liquor licenses. However, Extensive rulemaking around the safety elements still need to be occurred by the Department of Labor and Industries. How many chuckles are these guys having? Right? I mean, they're like, okay, here's what we're working on. Somebody sold it to them with a straight face. And then our legislature and our, you know, governor is like, yeah, it's good. It's good for the workers. Good for the dancers. Yeah. Booze up the patrons. This should be fine. Give them some protocol. Give them some safety requirements. It's all good. Nope. What could go wrong? That's, that's the bottom line here. And that's right in the title of this podcast. It's like, okay, you got this and this. Mm, mm, okay. So, so <laughs> all of the burden was on the workforce, on the dancers, Saldana said. It wasn't viable and it wasn't sustainable. Without booze, these, these uh, strip clubs are not financially feasible, right? So they've been taking the big cut out of what the dancers, you know, 150 bucks, they charge the dancers for basically an independent contractor opportunity to work the stage, work the pole. Do you ever think about how, how much bacteria is on those poles? Mm, right? It's like, mm. Dancers testified to the state lawmakers that allowing alcohol sales would keep the clubs economically viable so they wouldn't have to rely on fees. They currently charge the workers to be on stage in the first place. There was a push by some King County prosecutors for the governor to veto Section 3 of SB 6105. Ixnay, the number 3A, right? Which would prevent Seattle and unincorporated King County, which might be a little more conservative, from passing any laws mandating a specific distance between the customers and dancers. Now, I, I'm still a little murky on that part, but the dancers are saying, well, it prevents them from collecting the cash from the customers. Like, mm, okay, all right. I, you know what I mean? It's just like, okay, whatever. Let's talk about homelessness in Denver. <laughs> you know what I mean? Something that I do understand, and we are going to talk about that, that today. I got a good one for you on that one. Prosecutors argued that strip clubs have historically been connected to Higher rates of crime in Section 3 would take away Seattle's ability to address these concerns without, without local legislation. The vast majority of strip clubs in Washington are located in Seattle. Now, I read an article that we only have 11 strip clubs in the state of Washington. That cannot be right. There's no way. Because we've got Seattle, and I can name a handful off the top of my head, 
And then we've got, we've got Spokane and we've got uh, Tacoma. And you can't tell me between Tacoma and Spokane, we don't have 20, 30 strip clubs, right? I mean, it's just inherently it makes sense. But whatever. Removing Section 3 from the bill would have made it harder to collect payment from customers, according to dancers, and put them at risk of being cited by local police for doing their jobs. Literally. That's a head-scratcher. Like, what? Um, I, yeah. Right? You're just kind of left with, uh, okay, all right, okay. Now, we heard this. I think one of the most important parts of this legislation is the section they were trying to veto, which includes decriminalization of dancer conduct. This was said by Peach. She's a stripper, the mask, who is active in the advocacy group, strippers or workers. It's still kind of surreal that this passed. And at any <laughs> when a stripper says that something is surreal that it passed, then you're like, uh huh, okay, yeah, all right, okay, yeah. Do I think strip clubs should be shut down? I mean, it's kind of one of those things. If if that's your thing, if that's what you want to do, and if you can keep this element of, you know, harming the female in the component, which you really can't. That's, that's where I, ah, but it's empowering for women, Sean. It's empowering for them to take off their clothes. All right. But yeah, every, is it really, is it really, I mean, for strangers that are now going to be boozed up? I mean, I pitch that to me. I mean, I live in Washington. Still kind of surreal that this passed at any moment. I was thinking that any portion that could get vetoed or that the bill would, would die like it did before. This is my state, folks. This is, I mean, you know, you can complain about this kind of stuff that this is going on, or you can look at it and you can flip it around and go, I'm going to have podcasts for the rest of my life here in Washington State. I really am. People always tell me, Sean, you've got to get out of there. You need to leave before it crumbles. Well, I mean, hasn't it already? We had CHOP, right? Isn't that already kind of a cookie crumbling? Yeah, two murders at a, you know, allegedly Black Lives Matter rally. Two murders of two black kids. I mean, proof is in the pudding, right? But now we got strip clubs that, you know, are going to have some safety protocol and the customers are going to get boozed up. I mean, that just seems what could go wrong, right? Absolutely what could go wrong. Yeah. As I say that, you're thinking that through. Well, this, 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 this. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's why we're talking about this here on News for Reasonable People. All right, let's move on to the next segment. Let's move on to the next segment. Let's see what you guys are talking about on the live stream. Jeff Grill, you said something funny. Oh, you said, um, was that person, the, the, the state representative, is that the person that was bald? that um, was stealing women's clothing, was stealing straight up suitcases. Wasn't that a, <clears throat> wasn't that somebody in the federal government that was doing that? They stole a couple of suitcases and they were dressed in such outrageous, you know, outfits that they were immediately able to identify them. And the suitcases that that individual stole, I think it was a they, them, the suitcases that those, that individuals was able, was stole from a couple of different airports were just so flamboyant that it was so easy to pick up. Yeah, this was not that person, but you know, <clears throat> it wouldn't have been a stretch to have that be interchangeable at all. All right. Scorch, Scorch, talking about peach. <laughs> you got, <laughs> is that a peach milkshake? Uh, you guys are just gonna take that and run with it. I know you are, I know you are. All right, here is our next topic. Do I need to, no, we're good, we're good. You know, all right. So what the title says, let's roll with it. Here we go. Ron DeSantis of Florida, he eliminates the squatters' rights in, in Florida, giving power to cops to remove offenders. He is just basically drilling down, dropping the hammer on squatters and saying, we are not doing this anymore. People squat, they're going to be arrested. They're going to be tossed out. That's what we're doing in Florida. Let's get into it. Here we go. I think this one is great, too. Uh, DeSantis comes right out and says, um, end the squatters scam. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, uh, you know, and, and there's a fine line between tenants 
who once had a lease and are no longer paying, and squatters who just break into a place and occupy it. With so many snowbirds in Florida, people that live elsewhere, fly in for the winter, you know, you used to be able to leave your home, leave your condo, leave whatever, and maybe you have somebody come check on it once a month, once every two weeks, something like that. But with squatting as a known quantity, oh, quick update. Remember this joker? Remember this absolute nutcake? Um, he's the illegal immigrant from uh, Venezuela. He was telling people how to invade American homes and, and invoke squatters' rights. Yeah, well, he's in a scooch of trouble with ICE. Migrant influencer urging illegals to squat in homes on the run from authorities. Imagine that. Somebody at ICE said, hey, the guy's giving away all the secrets. What's going on here? We can't have that. Got to shut that guy up. You know who else they're trying to shut up? P. Diddy, Sean Puffy Combs. You followed that story? That's an interesting one. What did he do? Yeah, a lot of allegations of rape there with uh, Sean Puffy Combs. Maybe he did it, maybe he didn't. Who knows? But um, yeah, he had the uh, FBI just go through his house and yeah. Did a little toss action and see what's there. See what see what's there. They always seem to come up with something, don't they? They they find something. Let's get back and read this article. Let's see what Ron did. So we've got Republican in Florida Governor Ron DeSantis on Wednesday signed legislation into law that eliminates squatters' rights in the Sunshine State and increases penalties against offenders. <laughs> I was reading somewhere that whatever New York and um, Illinois do. Florida does the opposite. Florida does the opposite. And then Texas follows suit like shortly after. I mean, it just, when I was growing up as a kid, Florida used to be the laughing stock. They used to have just the craziest stories come out of there. Now they've got reasonable, they've still got crazy people there, but they've got, you know, this conservative governor and conservative people. Yeah, what am I doing in Washington? What am I doing here? You're not going to be able to commit to, to commandeer somebody's private property and expect to get away with it. We're in the state of Florida, ending the squatter scam once and for all. Could you imagine, like my governor, what we just saw sign into law, the you know the strippers' bill of rights, doing this? Oh man, he would immediately get thrown out. The law will take effect July 1st. DeSantis noted ahead of the signing that he believes Florida is the first state in the nation to take squatting issues head on. I, I believe he's correct. I don't know of any other state. I'd be podcasting if, if, if there was, unless somebody already had some laws on the books, but I don't, I don't think so. Because we've had, we've had this huge push for tenant advocacy. Ah, the poor tenants. And there has been times throughout history where tenants have just been railed on. And they're getting railed on by slumlords in multiple areas, but the, you know, the, the vast consensus is that these laws, these tenant protecting laws have gone too far. They've, they've just crossed the line. They're way over the top. And now nobody wants to be a landlord. And um, shockingly, uh, when landlords have the opportunity to either re-up, you know, a lease and put it back in the rental pool or sell it for a huge profit because of the constriction of supply and the massive demand for single family housing, oftentimes they are not putting it back in the pool of rental housing, therefore driving some of your prices up, right? Yeah, you've got that going on. And these, these leaders in blue cities and blue states, they're just sitting around scratching their head going, ah, we need more affordable housing. Well, good luck there. You already, you know, your development constraints have already created a situation where development doesn't happen, you know, quickly um, in, in most of the states where you've got a huge Constriction on the housing supply, a massive, um, huge demand, no supply. You got no supply. We have areas here in Washington right now that have two weeks of housing supply. Two weeks. That means if no more comes on right now with the absorption rate, the number of buyers out there buying, and buyers have slowed way down. I mean, it's been, it's been cricket since July of 2022. Starting to pick up a little bit, starting to pick up a little bit. But even with as few buyers out there who are willing to step into a six and a half or seven percent mortgage, whatever it might be, sorry for hitting the mic, um, it would outstrip whatever you know homes number of homes are on the market in two weeks, and you'd have no homes to look at. 
hey, can we go? We're ready to buy a house. Can we go look at some today? No. How come? There aren't any. What? What, what do you mean? How come? Oh, uh, we need more affordable housing. Yeah, we do. It's not happening. That's not happening. And anything run by the government is never going to be affordable, right? Before the bill's passage, squatters in Florida, as well as in states from coast to coast, were considered tenants. How is that? How is a squatter a tenant? Toss them out. Toss them out. Toss them out. Go in there, toss them out, toss their stuff out. Squatter squad, right? Squatter squad. Check out that podcast. And the squatters required legal property owners to launch lengthy court battles to legally remove inhabitants from a home. Today at 1.30 my time, Jimmy, he's the landlord at the Woodridge, the Bellevue protest that we had a couple of weekends ago that got national attention. One of my, uh, one of my son Karen's friends sent him that I know well, he used to be a broker here at Summit, sent my son Karen a couple of TikToks. They had hundreds of thousands of views. And I'm in those videos because I'm following Jonathan Cho around on this, you know, story here in Bellevue. Well, Jimmy, the homeowner, he has a, a protection order, I think, against him being heard today. So it's like he's going up knocking, hey, where's my money? You, you've been, not been paying rent for literally years now. And where's my money? I need my money. The guy's taking out a protection order on him. I mean, that, that's just how crazy this battle has become. It's become so one-sided. This is an important bill that if you see the stories that happened, Republican State Senator Keith Perry, who sponsored the bill, said as it made its way through the legislature, according to Wear TV, it's egregious what people are getting away with under legislation. So Florida just, boom, takes care of it. Man, that would be, that would be cool. That would be cool to have a governor like Ron DeSantis. Some of the stuff he comes up with, I'm like, okay, that's a little too far. You pushed it a little too far. If you would have just edged back a little bit, you would have brought a lot more people in because what you did might be considered, you know, not 100% reasonable, but 95% of what, what is happening in Florida from a legislative standpoint and a leadership standpoint, I agree with. I agree with. I'm, I'm just like, you go, Ron. You go, Ron. Under the new law, property owners can now call on the sheriff's office to immediately remove squatters from their homes if the suspects are unable to produce documents authorizing their residency by the property owner. What you've got now is you've got these squatters that make up fake leases, but they're so bad. They're so bad that it's, just, it's not believable at all because they're not the brightest. I mean, they're squatters. There's a reason they're squatters. They didn't go to grad school to become a squatter. Let's just say that, right? Not happening. Not happening. So they present this to the police and the police go, ah, it's a civil matter. We're not the squatter police. We're not the tenant arbitration department. Got to take that up in court. So the police kick it to the court system and the court system is just, it's backed up. Nobody's doing hearings. And it's just, it's a mess. It's a complete mess and breakdown. So landlords are... You know, they're footing the bill on, by that I mean paying, for all of this. And they did during the pandemic as well. We had that eviction moratorium. We're going to close down the economy and we're going to make the landlords pay for it as far as housing goes. That's the one-sided equation we got going on here. Well, now you're seeing the, the flip end of that. You're seeing legislation. And a bunch of other states will put this in, in, in place as well. They'll go, hey, Florida did it. We're doing it too. The law will give the homeowner the ability to quickly and legally remove a squatter from a property, which will increase criminal penalties for squatting. Good. Throw them in jail. Don't care. You squat on somebody's property, throw them in jail. Give them a two, three-year sentence. I don't know. Does that seem reasonable? I think so. Now, we have not had the same type of issues here as you've seen in California or New York. Nevertheless, our laws were really geared towards this not necessarily being a fad, DeSantis said, while standing in front of a podium with a sign reading, End the squatter's scam. That's just great. I think there's a photo of that here. Where's the squat? Uh, maybe not. That was, it was just funny. Yeah, there it is. Uh, right at the top. And ending the squatter's scam. So funny. So they're siding with the squatters, he said, of the Democrat-led states. In fact, we've seen squatters move in and claim residence. This forces a massive, long drawn-out judicial review 
that Jimmy is going through right now, ten, uh, landlord Jimmy here in Bellevue, without, before they can even be removed from the property. These are people that never had a right to be in the property to begin with. Boom. Correct. Never had a right. They're, they are trespassers. They are squatters. Throw them out. Throw them in jail. Prosecute them. Whether or not that's going to happen in Florida, who knows? But at least from the standpoint of the landlords, at least there's going to be some more ammunition there to fire at these losers. Earlier this month they, in New York, a woman returned to a property she inherited to find squatters living there. Ron DeSantis, he talked about all this. We podcasted that, right? She changed the locks to get them out, and the state of New York arrested her instead of the squatters. Yeah. Yeah. And Jimmy is getting a, there's a protection order. They're literally talking about that because he's trying to get his money from the deadbeat tenant. So, oh yeah, you can't go there. You can't go to your own house and demand somebody pay you. That's, that's un-American. The law establishes harsher penalties against those who participate in squatting crimes, including leveling a second-degree felony charge against squatters who damage a home, a first-degree felony charge against those who fraudulently sell or lease a property, and a misdemeanor charge against those who purposely present a fraudulent lease. Good. I think that is all fair. That is all totally reasonable, especially first-degree felony charge for somebody who fraudulently sells or leases a property that is not theirs. That is not theirs. Somebody's obtained the American dream, however it is, of home ownership, and then somebody else comes along and takes it? Huh. Yeah, that's a felony. Yeah, straight to jail there, son. Five to ten. We're going to give you a quick five to ten. Don't bend over for the soap. Sheriff Dennis M. Lima, he celebrated the passage of the bill and the governor's signature while saying that the word squatter is too favorable. <laughs> It's too favorable, and they should instead be referred to as criminal, criminals and con artists. It's like Tim Pool saying, hey, don't call them illegals. Call them criminal aliens, because that's legally what they are. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, I haven't thrown that out there in conversation, but, you know, criminal alien? All right. Okay, yeah. And the reason being they're criminal? They came into the United States illegally, period. You know, when all these... these um, Immigration advocates, oh, they're not criminals. They're, they're, they're um, employment seekers. They're employment seekers. They're newcomers. They're new. You got to welcome them. Everybody give the newcomers a hand. Go up and introduce yourself like at church and say, hey, I'm here. Hey, it's so good to see you. I want to thank our legislative body, both our delegates here in Central Florida and abroad, because this received unanimous support. Just boom. This is what we're doing. Squatters actually is a very, very kind term. These are criminals and con artists that need to be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law, he continued. The flip side in my state here would be that you know, housing's too expensive and you know these people, they, they don't have a skill set where they can you know, easily get a job, they can't afford it, therefore they're just living in your house and we gotta support them. We gotta support them. We gotta support those strippers too. I mean, geez, how else are you gonna you know, see somebody who's not your spouse or whatever naked? What are you going to do? You got to support these things. Florida, similar to other states across the nation, has seen repeated incidents of squatters fraudulently moving into a home or property, including a squatter in September who moved into a multi-million dollar home in Bonita Springs and was found wearing the homeowner's clothing. That's a great shirt. I love that shirt. Yeah, it's yours. Took it from your closet, squatting in your house. How's that? Another homeowner in June who was on vacation abroad before returning to his Ocala House was forced to confront a squatter who trashed his property in his absence. How about the squatters that took over that multi-million dollar home in Beverly Hills? Yeah, and they were throwing huge parties. And the police came, hey. And it just, it, you know, it was tied up in litigation. Now it's on the market. I mean, that was a multi, multi, multi-million dollar home. I'm sure, that's looking good, right? The pool was green. You could see the pool from the outside was green. I don't think there's anything else in here. I did want to mention this one. Squatter pirates in Florida setting up homes on abandoned boats. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, no matter where I go, there's always a whole bunch of boats. And since I got a boat now, I look at boats and I'm like, that boat hasn't been, that hasn't been touched for years. So it's not shocking that people break into these boats and ah, I'm squatting on a boat. And I'm sure, you know, the environmental issues with people who squat on boats. Jump it overboard. Dump it into the lake. Dump it into the ocean, dump 
but wherever it'll work out. It's fine. But yeah, we need to we need to have squatters now. Washington State's probably gonna have a squatters bill of rights, right? That's just how things go in my state. It's just so bad. Hey, here's the um, here's the guy from um, I think this is the guy from Squatter Squad that um, we talked about that squad. No, this is the Squatter Hunter. Sorry, Squatter Hunter is different than Squatter Squad. Flash Shelton, known as the Squatter Hunter, who removes squatters from people's homes, also spoke during the press conference, explaining how he personally dealt with confronting and removing squatters from his mother's home last year. Now, <laughs> where you need to have stories on how to share, how to get a squatter out of your home, that's when you know you've got issues, right? You get a big box of tissues for all of your issues because you got them. These people are just squatting left and right. Well, not in Florida anymore, right? Not in Florida anymore. They said no, no on that. Man, I hope a bunch of other states follow suit because as, as you can see, as these issues come up, you got some states that are saying, yep, we're going to do that. And other states that are pulling back going, oh, far left in our state, they would go berserk at this. But somehow they would claim, oh, the squatters are just underprivileged and this is racist. That's what you'd have. DEI on this is wrong. Can't have that. That's no good. All right, that's it for me on this one. I'm going to move on to the next topic. I'm going to move on to the next one. And this, this next one is, um, this one's interesting. What we're seeing is we've seen the numbers. I'll do the intro and then we'll get into it. How's that? I'm going to, I'm going to take a drink of water and we're going to, I'm going to see what you guys, what you jokers are, are talking about over here. Meth boat. Absolutely. Who doesn't want a meth boat? Go on a boat, do a little meth. Problem with that is you got fuel lines and all kinds of lines to catch on fire. They say never to put a, uh, put a uh, candle on a boat. It's a good idea. Yeah, I have a shirt just like that. It's because the squatter is wearing his shirt. Yeah. That's, yeah, that was all I was talking about. It's like, hey, that's, that, that's a nice looking shirt. You have really good taste. <laughs> that's because it's yours. So crazy, right? So crazy. All right, let's get into this one. Thousands of migrants set to arrive in massive El Paso bound caravan in just a few days. So what we have is these big, huge groups of migrants that kind of band together their strength in numbers. You've got one that is somewhere between two and 3,000 people right now headed for Texas. And it's going to get bigger as it goes from southern Mexico to the northern border to the southern border of the U.S. That thing, that bad boy could get pretty big. You could have four or 5,000 people. And we saw that last winter. Let's get into it. Here we go. So what I was going to say is that right before Christmas, uh, maybe it was right after Christmas, we also had a number of these big caravans that started getting turned back by Mexican authorities. Mexico is trying to, they're basically trying to strong arm the United States into you know, giving them 20 billion for this, we need this, we need this. Otherwise, we're gonna let a few more immigrants come through. The number of immigrants coming through the southern border has been really suppressed. And a lot of that has to do with the Mexican government right now. If you get busted near Mexico City, maybe a little further, they're gonna move you a step back. If you get busted that step back, they're going to move you back. They're going to move you like one stop back, which is the equivalent of like a six and a half hour drive, maybe a three hour drive, maybe a two and a half hour drive. And eventually, if you're not good at, you know, Caminante being a walker, migrant walker, you're going to end up all the way back at the Mexico-Guatemala border. So you've got this, you know, this, this hamster <laughs> treadmill going on right now, but eventually, and I've talked about this before, eventually that's going to burst. The Mexican government's going to go, hey, United States, go F yourselves. We're not doing this anymore. We only have so much in the way of resources. You didn't do what we told you to do. Plus, we're, you know, we're really good friends with Biden and Biden doesn't, you know, he, he loves immigration. He loves bringing them all, all the illegals in. So why wouldn't we just, so at some point in time, Mexican government's going to stop and these caravans are just going to boom, go. The last big caravan that happened the Mexican government pulled a fast one and essentially said, hey, pull over. You guys, a you know, couple thousand of them, pull over here. We'll get you paperwork so that you're legal 
all the way through to the U.S. border. And um, yeah, they didn't. They lied. They basically just took those people out of circulation. All their contacts were lost. And they, they just, they lied to us. The Mexican government lied to you? No way. I don't believe that for a second. So they got lied to, and then eventually they had to get their momentum back. But, you know, these big groups, if they can tear them apart, you got people leaving, people still going, people going back, you know, whatever might happen. So a new 2,000-person migrant caravan is making its way north to the U.S. border and is expected to reach El Paso, Texas, in just the next few days. All right. All right. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take exception to that. So this is happening in the state of Chiapas, which is down by Guatemala. Here is the, the city. Tapachula is where they are starting from in that state that I just mentioned. And it is roughly by car to El Paso. It is a 35-hour drive. Now, this group of migrants, 2,000 group of migrants, they started on Monday. Today is Thursday. And if you were to walk this route, it would be 625 hours of walking. It's a long ass walk. Now we're talking sometime late spring. They're going to be there, right? <laughs> I mean, they're not coming tomorrow. You don't need to worry about them coming tomorrow. But so in the jet next few days, no, but it, that sounds better. That sounds like, hey, this is coming. This is happening. Videos posted online show a swarm of people walking through the streets of southern Mexico on Monday. So to go from southern Mexico to our southern border, yeah, 600 plus hours of walking. Yeah, that's a long walk. It's a long walk. In one clip, an apparent leader could be seen encouraging the group through a bullhorn to chant, a la frontera, meaning to the border. The group proclaimed in Spanish, we are not criminals. We are international workers. All right. Yeah, but you're, you're illegal international workers you don't have a U.S. citizenship and you are coming into the U.S. illegally. Yes. Yes, you are. That's what you are. So if you want to spin it as international workers looking for a job, I get that. I get that. But you're wreaking some real havoc on the whole system. And we all know what the end game is. All right, let's get in there before Trump maybe becomes president again. Oh, because man, he, he, he wasn't kind to us. He really restricted that border down and kicked a bunch of us back, and now he's threatening to, uh, to send us uh, back on day one. Interesting to see, right? Know a lot of people down at the border, they're like, we need Trump back. Trump back now. That's what they're saying. That's what they're hoping for. Church-run border shelters are preparing for the group's arrival as they run out of space to house the thousands of migrants trying to make their way into the United States, according to the border report. We are in contact with people and personnel in migrant shelters in South Mexico. The Reverend Francisco Bueno Guillen, director of Casa del Migrante Shelter in the border city of Juarez, Mexico, told the news station. They saw many people have come into the country recently and are being joined by others already there, he said. And yes, they are coming to Juarez. So we're getting, getting ready for them. We're, we're preparing. What's interesting is um, this is from the New York Post. It was one of the few outlets that covered this because everybody else is like, oh, don't say anything about big groups of migrants. That's not going to work out well. One of the reasons I'm reading this is because we had that whole, I didn't podcast on it because I don't really podcast on individual events unless they have to do with a bigger topic, like murders. I'm going to tell you about some murders here shortly in Denver. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that? Is that shocking to you? I know. At a homeless shelter, at a homeless We've talked about it before. We're going to talk about it again because it's pretty in interesting. It's pretty entertaining. I don't normally talk about murder, you know, an individual murder, unless it has to do with a big ongoing topic. So the illegal immigrants that bum rushed the um, border in El Paso, they basically, you know, they're cutting through the fence and they're hammered on some of the border protection guys. You know, and there's that whole big thing and a bunch of them got arrested. It was just, you know, it was all over the news. But it's like, all right, so that happened, okay, and what's the real story? Now, the real story is the ongoing. Hey, Texas is handling it this way. We got the Supreme Court ruling because Biden is suing the you know, Texas government because, you know, Greg Abbott is doing such a great job that we can't have that. We can't have, you know, Texas actually protecting its southern border. That's a no-no. We need to 
give it back to the Fed so that Customs and Border Protection can go back to not doing their job, right? Because that's what is dictated at, you know, from the top down. Don't do your job. Just act as a travel agent. What city would you like to go to? Over there, get in my Uber white van and I will drive you to the nearest migrant shelter where then you'll check in and they will then take you to your local destination, hopefully Denver, because Denver seems least able to, maybe Chicago, maybe you'd like to go to Chicago. Either one of those cities are not doing well right now managing this crisis, right? They're just not. They're like, ah. And one of my podcasts yesterday was um, Let's Go Brandon Johnson. Yeah, he's, uh, he is mum on how much is being spent on the, uh, the migrant shelter. Somewhere around in between three hotels that he's got going on for the migrants, for the illegals, spending a million bucks a week. A million bucks a week. Mm. And so one of the reasons for reading this podcast is that you've got a big influx of migrants coming. They are a coming. It's a matter of when. It's a matter of when. Will this pod of uh, migrants, will they get derailed? Yeah, maybe. It's going to take them a long time to get there. Yeah, 600 hours of walking. So you can see why they want to take a bus or anything else. But oftentimes, you know, you'll see those horrible events where they get put in, you know, enclosed truck and a bunch of them die because, you know, the more times they stop and let people out, it's kind of an indication of, hey, we've got a little human trafficking going on here. And yeah, that's not exactly illegal. He said they're expecting at least 2,000 migrants who set off from Chiapas, Mexico to arrive in El Paso in the coming days, not the next few days. But in the coming days, I would say late spring, right? Late spring. And as those groups go through, there are strength in numbers. Those, those groups get bigger. Because people hanging out in different areas are like, ah, let's team up with them. Because, you know, they've got a little bit more protection as they go through in a big group. The so-called Migrants Via Cru Crucis was organized by Mexican activists in Chiapas to ensure the safety of migrants making their way to the U.S., it left the city of Tapachula on the border of Guatemala on Monday, according to Border Report. Yeah, so this whole concept of um, they're going to be there in a couple of days. I mean, even, <laughs> even by bus, I believe, it took two days and one hour just on a bus going. That's how far away it is. I mean, that makes sense, right? Southern end of Mexico up to, I mean, it's, it's literally at Guatemala. It's like, okay, how's your geography? That is not a couple of day walk, is it? So another group of several hundred foreign nationals have also set up a camp behind a convenience store in Chihuahua City, about 230 miles from El Paso, it reports. So you, you but you've always got this stuff going on. You've always got, well, we got a thing there and got a thing here in California, got a thing in Arizona, we got things going on in Texas, got the El Paso deal. They, they got so worked up and so upset that they, I mean, what are you thinking when you just bust through a fence set up by Customs and Border Protection? You know, you're so, you're so desperate to get into the U.S. that you commit yet another crime and you just don't care. You just want in. You just break your way in. I mean, think about that. They are literally breaking their way in and hoping, hoping that they get arrested by Customs and Border Protection. Because if Tex Texas National Guard gets them, they might do a little, yep, you need to go back to Mexico. You need to go back. And that's what all this big, big uh, deal is, is that the uh, state of Texas is basically taking over the job of the, the feds. And um, state of Texas, Governor Greg Abbott, he is claiming responsibility for those numbers being way, way down. They're way, way down relative to December. But as far as February's go, this past February we had last month, that was a record-setting February. And our numbers are way down of who's in, you know, the pipeline relative to what we experienced in late 2023. So that kind of tells you, you know, uh, it, it's all relative, right? So we've still got, what was it last month? 170,000 came through, something like that. But it was 370,000 through all throughout all the borders in the United States, 302,034 came across just the southern border in the state of, uh, in, in the month of December. I mean, those are incredible numbers, incredible numbers. My family, we had a, um, we had a family gathering for my Aunt Nancy, and um, she is probably one of the most ardent fans 
of this podcast. So it's pretty cool to have an aunt like that who just, you know, she, she's always, always listening. Now, my uncle says that my aunt falls asleep to my podcast. It puts her to sleep. So take that as you will. But I tell my aunt that it's, um, it's osmosis. You're listening and you're learning from nephew Sean by osmosis. But my uncle, during the dinner, he said, you know, 11 million people is what Customs and Border Protection have basically stated have come into the United States within the time frame of the Biden administration. 11 million people. 11 million people. That's nuts. That is absolute insanity. And we've always got, uh, you know, we've always got some. There's, there's no way you're going to prevent, you know, all the illegals coming through. But just th those levels. I mean, look at some of these photos here. And these are just, you know, you got the Mexican National, the uh, Army going by, National Guard, whatever they are, military travel alongside. And just these enormous, it's got an umbrella here. I mean, it's hot. You're walking along. I mean, what a disaster. So it was just at, uh, but Gillen said that the Casa del Migrante shelter has already been filling up. You're hearing stories about the capacity being tapped out. Or what you're hearing, our funding has been eliminated. We had one in San Diego not long ago. Migrant intake center had to shut down. No more funding. No more federal government funding. State doesn't have it. Local authorities don't have it. No more money. So they're literally in San Diego just cutting people loose. Hey, you know, here's a map. You got a phone? You got a phone? That way, El Norte. Go north. You need to go that way. That's where you're headed. They're literally doing that number to people that are illegally in the United States, don't speak English, don't, you know, this whole thing is just, it's just such a train wreck from the beginning. The Kiko Romero Municipal Gym is also three quarters full as of Wednesday, Juarez Human Rights Office Director, he said. So things are getting full. What, what the point is, is that you got people on the move, people on the move. Uh, a massive surge just happened from... Okay, we're going to go, we go from Colombia into Panama, and that is the Darien Gap. Just had a massive surge of illegals go through that little drill. So they are a coming. I mean, there's, there's no way around it, right? So El Paso has shown itself to be very able to gear up when the surge comes and provide a safe and orderly way for those who have been permitted to come in to find a secure situation. And Continue on their paths, said Border, Patrol, Border Report. It's insane that this is going on. I don't think there was anything else here. Yeah, we talked about the Texas authorities uh, charged nine immigrants um, involved in the breach. That was the breach at El Paso. They just, they rushed the concertina wire and they trampled over Border Patrol agents in their way. They're so desperate to get into the U.S. And they're tired of waiting. You know, they're tired of waiting. They're saying, hey, Mexican, the... the People in Mexico are not treating us well. Imagine that. Shocked. I'm shocked, right? I mean, no, it's a, it's, it's a brutal journey for most of these people. You got to pay a lot of money, and most of them are indentured when they get here. But this is literally what the Biden administration has just given a huge rubber green stamp that says, go, 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 keep going. There you go. Keep going. El Norte. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going going to load up these jurisdictions with census, going to get the House of Representatives to go our way. I mean, is that the end goal? That's what a lot of people talk about, right? A lot of people talk about that is the end goal, changing U.S. politics by just slamming a bunch of you know folks through that won't be able to vote. But when you've got the census being counted every 10 years, yeah, that's going to come in handy. It's going to come in handy. But a lot of folks think we got going on. Whatever it is, it's wild. And by wild, I mean, shouldn't be happening. And yet, here we are. So make that vote count. I know you guys are reasonable. And um, you will make that vote count. So many other people are like, God, ah, they're just international workers. Mm -hmm. Okay. How many more news stories are we going to have to have like Lake and Riley, right? Say her name. Yeah. I mean, it's it, that whole thing is just like, I'm sorry, what? What happened? Okay. You let enough, you know, you let 11, 11 million people in, you can have a certain percentage they are going to be bad hombres. And that's what we're experiencing now, along with numbers escalating as the, the warm weather hits, as, as spring becomes summer. That's when peak 
Caminante season is hot. I mean, that's why you got so many people dying in that desert and just, oof, not good. All right. I'm going to transition on to the next segment here. And um, yeah, let's do that. So let's see what you guys are talking about on the, uh, on the live stream. Yeah, how about the Alabama Democrat who recently won a red county on that issue? Was that, I think it was, was that on, uh, I'm not sure what the issue you're talking about, but I'm thinking it was like in vitro fertilization, I think was how that story went. Let's go, Brandon Johnson is worse than Beetlejuice. I was talking about that yesterday. Um, yeah, probably, probably. I would say let's go Brandon Johnson from a I don't know. I I'm I'm just, I'm I'm thinking through news stories that I did. Let's go Brandon Johnson is more of a moron. How's that? I think Beetlejuice was conniving. I think she had her agenda and I think she worked that better than let's go Brandon Johnson. Let's go Brandon Johnson is just he's a moron. I mean, he 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 shouldn't be in the position he's in. He has he doesn't have a skill set to run Chicago. And yet here he is. Ah, it should work out fine. Yeah, it should be good. I mean, the teachers union, they endorsed him. So this couldn't be bad. The police union did not, but I'm sure it'll work out fine. And then how's, uh, how's criminal activity going in, uh, in Chicago? Let's take, you know what, since we're on a live stream, this isn't part of the main thing. Let's go. Uh, let's just go take a look at Hey Jackass. Hey Jackass Chicago. And let's see what's going on. I mean, why wouldn't we? All right. March to date, shot and killed 35. Shot and wounded 134. Total homicides 39. Let's see. A year to date. We're only in March, though. So these numbers are. All right. A person is shot every four minutes and 19 seconds. A person is murdered every 19 hours and 31 minutes. Those numbers are down. It's looking. I, I'm going to have to take it all back. Let's go. Brandon Johnson is doing some work. Yeah, I mean, those numbers fluctuate wildly, right? It's winter. People stay inside in Chicago. Wait till summer hits. Although it's spring right now, right? Spring. I keep forgetting because I'm in Seattle and we're in the north. And, you know, if we get a good sunshiny day here, it's, it's, it's shirts off weather. Dudes only, right? Dudes only. Let's be reasonable. Um, because you might get that, you know, you might get a tiny little bit of color to your... I got a little color last weekend being out gardening all weekend. But okay, so the numbers, yeah, they're horrific. Every four minutes and 19 seconds, a person is shot. Not good, but um, I've seen way worse with Chicago. I love this one over here. You can see, um, all right, so you got 35 in the head. You got two in the arms, 43 in the torso, zero in the lower body. Nobody's shooting for the legs. There's some opportunity there. If you need to shoot somebody in Chicago, maybe legs is the way to go because nobody else is. And you got uh, 12 or unknown. Where was your dude shot? I don't know. Just bleeding everywhere. Couldn't figure it out. Yeah, not good. All right, I'm going to ramp up. I'm going to ramp up uh, the Great Wall of Independium. Oof, you guys are talking about some stuff over there. All right, let me, I'm going to get myself together here for our next one. Our next one is a good one. It's, it's good. It's good. Go like that. Thirsty Thursday. Is anybody going to partake? Thirsty Thursday? That's what you do in college, right? Wacky Wednesday? Taco Tuesday? Every day has a purpose. Don't let anybody tell you different, right? All right. Here we go. <clears throat> Denver Homeless Hotel. The Double Tree Hotel. It's had seven deaths since January, including, including a double murder. What do we got going on in Denver? We've got shenanigans happening in Denver. Let's get into it. Here we go. I, I almost feel kind of bad for Denver because I keep picking on Denver, but Denver is just, Denver is just lobbing up topic after topic after topic. None of them particularly good. It's like Seattle. There's always something 
good happening. I mean, there, there is, there, there's good stuff happening everywhere. You can, you know, glass half full, glass half empty. Well, I like to point out the half empty stuff because, you know, it's not reasonable. But Denver has just been on a roll. Um, as far as incompetence goes, I would say Mike Johnston, I, I would say he's, he's, he's definitely top five of incompetent out there. I'd put Mike Johnston out there. I put him up there with um, Let's Go Brandon Johnson, Beetlejuice, you betcha. Um, how about Mayor of Portland? Um, <laughs> Mayor Ted Wheeler, that guy, that guy, he just, yeah. But no, Denver, homeless hotel, seven deaths since January. You, you imagine council meetings that are going to come up? Hey, I mean, you know, local officials are going to be, yeah, you know, we've had some issues. Yeah, you had seven people die in the hotel. Two more double murders. What's up? What's up with that? Well, yeah. Here's the other story that just happened. This is another one on top of this. Woman shot inside former hotel converted to shelter in North Denver. That happened last night. That happened last night. Woman could, maybe she got shot in the leg. I don't know. This is Denver, though. You're going to have to have a different stat map, right? So you know, the ongoing theme here is um, maybe you don't want to hang out at the double murder tree in Denver. Podcast, I think it was last week that I did, was the um, credit union that just, boom, shut down. And, um, you know, given the fact that they are next door, I think it's, uh, I'm going, I'm address here. 4,000, whatever the street is, is the address of the double homicide <laughs> uh, hotel. And then 4040 is the address. And um, I, I'll remember the street name, but it'll probably be in the article here. It's literally next door. It's next door. So the credit union just overnight shut down. And given the fact that another shooting happened last night, I do not blame them. I do not blame them. I mean, this is just insanity. This is insanity. But look at this hotel. When you see an aerial map of this hotel, it's huge. Hundreds and hundreds of room, rooms. It's not like one of those, um, I want to say travel lodge, but a Marriott. Down in the south uh, in Texas and, and in Oklahoma, like the ones I stay at in Oklahoma City, you've got like kind of this set format for what a hotel looks like. They're boxy. They try and make them look you know, almost European now. And they got the port -a out front, which is just a carport. And um, most of them end right about here. On, uh, on They're just kind of this box and this rectangular box. This one is a big one. I mean, you see the aerial and you're like, oh my gosh, that is a lot of rooms. So, you know, what could go wrong when you put several hundred homeless people in one area and there's low barriers of entry? Meaning, you don't have to take a drug test. You don't have to do anything. You just, there's your key. Be safe in there. Yeah, seven people dead. I'll, I'll talk about this one for just a second. The shooting occurred inside the former hotel in Central Park, despite increased following security, following a, uh, despite increased security, following a recent double homicide. So we got a double homicide, got a shooting last night. That lady is supposed to be in okay condition. But um, yeah. Yeah, and then you've got thousands of illegal immigrants that are going to work their way to Denver. I'm sure it'll work out fine. It'll be fine. It'll be good. Federal government's going to have to step in and cough up, cough up some money at some point, aren't they? Because all these, all these virtue signaling uh, sanctuary cities, they're going to go tilt, just like this hotel is going tilt right now. Because, you know, what would happen if you put several hundred whacked out homeless people into a hotel altogether. Yeah, you're seeing it happen in real time. In real time. It's, it's, it's funny how few news outfits are covering this story. Because, ooh, yeah. Mainstream media. Oh, don't point that out. Mm, yeah. Mm, yeah. Seven people killed. Mm, yeah. What? Hey, now? I mean, they're mostly peaceful. They're mostly peaceful. I mean, yeah, they do a lot of drugs. And they've got hammers and machetes and whatnot. But... Seven people have died at a hotel turned shelter for Denver's homeless people since it opened in December, according to the city's medical examiner. This is per the city's medical examiner, right? You know what's crazy is 
they consider somebody who dies to exit the homeless system. You have exited into, uh, you know, typically I'd say casket, but nobody gets buried in a casket anymore. Like they get cremated, right? So they have exited the homeless situation. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's how the system works. Yeah. How many people did you have exit your program? Well, including the guys who got murdered. Oh, 14. Former Double Tree by Hilton Hotel. I'm sure Hilton is so proud of this. The former Double Tree, uh, Double Murder Tree by Hilton Hotel serves hundreds of homeless people under a campaign by Mayor Mike Johnston to move 2,000 individuals out of the city streets by the end of this year. How is that working out? How many murders? How many murders? Hmm. Yeah, okay. All right. How many people dead? Oh, how, how, how many was that? Oh, okay. That figure counts the 1,000-plus homeless individuals who moved into temporary shelters, including at the former Doubletree Hotel last year. The hotel located, okay, 4040 Quebec Street. Um, all right, I had uh, 4,000 as the, uh, 4,000 was the credit union. 4040 Quebec Street, right next door, came under a scrutiny following a, came under scrutiny. There was some concern about the double homicide. Came under scrutiny. We're putting a little bit of emphasis on, on this double homicide hotel. <laughs> following a double homicide on March 16th, when police said two victims were found dead inside a room. The medical examiner's office later determined they were shot to death. Oh, hey now. Yeah. In addition, five other deaths occurred at 4040 Quebec Street since January 19th. I'm sorry. What happened? Oh, yeah. Five other deaths happened since January 19th. Do you think, do you think they might get some, you know, Denver National Guard there? Do you think they might get an emphasis patrol? Do you think they might get a worker's bill of rights for the strippers? No, they won't get that. But what are they doing? Absolutely nutty, right? It's just nutty that this kind of stuff is going on. Ah, pack as many into a hotel as you can. We'll just see how it goes. We are seeing the fallout in real time of what happens when you do that. Because these people aren't, they're not sane. They're whacked out of their minds. They're willing to kill each other. They have zero issues doing that. The people want to say, well, they're, they're just down on their luck. And if they could just get a couple of weeks of being inside a room, everything's going to work out. That is literally what housing first, you know, the ideology behind that. It's kind of like harm reduction. Hey, you're going to shoot up some heroin, at least have a clean needle. Yeah, that's harm reduction. All harm, no reduction. Let me give you a clean crack pipe because we don't want you. Let me give you some chapstick because we don't want you to get chap lips. Yeah, that's literally one of the supplies that was handed out. I think it was down in Portland. You got a, uh, you get your, uh, you go to a birthday and you get a birthday party. What, what is that? A guest bag? You know, a little bag of stuff. You get some chapstick if you're doing the, if you're smoking the crack, if you're smoking the meth, smoking the fetty down in Portland. The causes of death remained unclear, though the medical examiner said it is awaiting toxicology results. Yeah, I'd say by the look of that bullet hole there, that guy died by gunfire. That's how, that's how I would rule it. All right, next, what else you got for me? A day prior to the ho double homicide on March 15th, two other deaths were reported at the hotel's location, according to the records. It's, you know, I start to giggle, and, it, it, and I giggle because it's so ridiculous. These are somebody's family members that are having their lives ended. Maybe they chose some, they had some really bad life choices somewhere in there. Maybe they're mental. Maybe they should be in a mental institution somewhere, but we don't do that anymore. Maybe they should be in prison. Yeah, maybe. Maybe they should be in a detox center getting cleaned up somewhere. They're not going to have that opportunity. Instead, we're just going to lump them all together in a hotel and call it good. And at least we'll get through the winter without somebody dying. Oh, never mind. Since January 19th. Three other deaths happened between January 19th and January 30th, the records also showed. The spokesperson with the mayor's office who contacted the Denver Gazette insisted not all deaths are related to the city's, get this, now for you Denver people, you know this name, All In Mile High program. All In Mile High. Anything to do with homelessness or drug addiction or whatever shouldn't have the word high in it. I understand. Denver's the mile high city and elevation over a mile high. All right, yeah, all in, mile high. What does that mean? What does that mean? It's just, it's, that's terrible. 
That's just terrible. That's the name adopted by the Johnston administration. All right. It's a name ad- adopted by the Johnston administration for the mayor's campaign to end homelessness. All in Mile High. D- to end homelessness? These people that get elected, I don't know. What's worse, the people that get elected or the people electing them? Yeah, it's tough, right? The city's homeless dashboard, which tracks exits. So now we're going to debate whether all the deaths are attributed to the homeless complex or not. So the city's homeless dashboard, which tracks exits from the city's all-in Mile High program, again, shows that a total of nine people have died. Nine! Nine! Fantastic. I mean, we're, we've got progress here. This is very progressive. Earlier, the dashboard showed that six people have died, and the mayor's office said four of those deaths occurred at the former Doubletree Hotel. You got a lot of people dying. That's the bottom line, right? Of the seven deaths at the former Doubletree Hotel tracked by the medical examiner, there were three guests or visitors, the mayor's office said, adding the city's homeless dashboard doesn't track deaths of people who are not part of the program. If you weren't in the Mile High Club, literally, in Denver, then they're not going to count you if you die. The medical examiner's office said it makes no distinction. Somebody dies, they die, we're going to count them. Seven dead, nine dead, whatever it is, per hotel, per hotel location, that's an incredible amount. I know we've got the we've got the Morrison Hotel here in Seattle, which is just infamous for I mean it has had so much corruption and murder and the street out in front of it is just a train wreck, but it's supported by the homeless industrial complex, right? It's supported by this group of people who are like, yeah, we just gotta save everybody. And nobody's getting off the drugs, nobody's getting off whatever. You know, we just created this super conducive atmosphere. Hey, let's put all the drug addicts together in a hotel. We'll just, you know, see how it goes because it's easier for us to get them, get them services. And now you are literally seeing the end result, which is seven murders, nine murders, whatever it is. A lot of people dying, right? Because that's what happens. These, these people don't give a rat's ass if, you know, if you're not paying them for the drugs. They take your drugs, you take their drugs. Who knows? Who knows what it's over? Right? You got a lot of that back and forth action going on. And that's why you see tents catch on fire so often. In Seattle, it happens all the time. And you'll hear somebody, ah, there were, it was a, um, it was a drug payment, you know, argument. So somebody came over and torched a, you know, nylon tent, not that hard to catch on fire. Not that hard to catch on fire. You got enough Looney Tunes, you know, hundreds of Looney Tunes running around in a hotel. Just run down the, you know, the hallway. To, <laughs> Did you guys see the video of the um, two cars in Atlanta, I think it was? They're just screaming down the freeway, and they're literally shooting at each other. You can see the gunfire coming out of their windows, and you're like, ooh, good Lord, that's not good. Nobody got hit. Median section got hit. But um, Atlanta, Atlanta's got some stories going on. They've got some crazy criminal activity happening right now. So... But Denver is one of the cities that I'm covering because, like I told somebody in the uh, premiere, each morning, if, if, if you haven't been following News for Reasonable People, each morning we premiere at 9 o'clock, we premiere a new video. And uh, we also release another video. Um, so we release two, Monday through Friday, and then one on Saturday, one on Sunday. But on the 9 a.m. premiere, I'm typically there. And somebody, <laughs> we were talking about Denver having pound for pound probably some of the craziest stories as far as homelessness, you know, just terrible decisions from the governor, ter- terrible decisions from the mayor of Denver, shouldn't have said governor, but, you know, governor as well. Just, you know, one event after another that give me podcast content for, for days, months, whatever it might be. So Denver has been a dark horse. I didn't used to read much about Denver because it just – it didn't have all of these stories coming out. But now, with this hotel, I mean, I've got a solid three podcasts out of this alone, right? Because you don't have this in other areas. And it's because they chose a massive hotel. And you've also got an element in Denver that um, I've had a ton of people tell me, hey, Denver's host. Denver has really turned a corner. And by that, we don't mean in a, in a positive manner. Denver is really on the struggle bus as far as, you know, all the illegals, not having enough housing, 
kicking people to the curb, people living in tents, just the crime, the the overall stuff going on, like we used to do to both you know San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle, and Chicago, and New York City. Talk about those cities because they've got content for days as well. And the common theme is they've all got similar leadership. Hmm. Yeah. What was that podcast that we read by uh, Republican leadership just a you know podcast or two ago? Yeah, shutting down the squatters' rights. We're going, we're going in opposite directions, aren't we? Just opposite directions. That's what it feels like, anyway. Is it civil war? I know everybody wants to jump on that topic. Is that what this is? Is this a civil war happening? I mean, when you start to look at all the stories, and you're like, okay, that's that's not good. That one's not good either. That's not good. Got some wild stuff happening. I don't know if it's a civil war. I don't know what it is, but I know it's happening. And I'm going to podcast it for you. And that's what we're doing. All right. I'm going to do an outro um, for all these videos. And then I'm going to hang out with you guys in the live stream for a second here. So here we go. <clears throat> Thank you so much for being part of this podcast. So, nope. I'm going to redo that because this is an outro. I got to figure out that how that goes in my head here. All right, that's it for me on this segment. Thank you so much for being here. Love to have you as a subscriber. Do all that good Facebook stuff, and I will see you on the next one. Thanks again for being here. See you soon. Bye for now. Live stream people, stick around. Let's see what you guys have going on. So I immediately turn to Scorch, who is talking about a gangbang in Denver. Huh, yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> 500 dudes are all in in the Mile High City. <laughs> That is horrible. That is terrible. Denver, like Portland, used to be a safe and friendly big city. It did. It did. I remember hanging out in Denver. Uh, my son, Kiernan, has been going to Denver. Yeah, he's, you know, I almost said college age, but he turns 31 on uh, Saturday. Denver, uh, and he used to, he goes, he does go to Denver. But he, you know, these kids, they kind of ignore the whole homeless thing. Right? That's not that bad. But um, he also, you know, spent a lot of time in Seattle and you get used to, hey, this isn't normal. This isn't normal. But if you're around it all the time, yeah, it's kind of normal. He went to the University of Washington in Seattle. You know, it's you know, tough area. I mean, you got some crazy stuff going on. Um, Denver, like Portland, used to be safe and friendly. Yeah, absolutely. Joe Biden won Colorado. That explains it all. It really does. It really does. I'm going to scroll up and see what you guys have been talking about. Chapstick. Winter, summer, <laughs> that cost one million. Ch Chapstick was in spring, I believe. Yeah. The year before, it was booty bump kits in, uh, in Seattle. It's where you put it where the sun don't shine because your veins have collapsed and harm, harm uh, reduction said, ah, got to have them get their drugs somehow and have them put it in the backside. It's the greatest thing ever. Peaches loves the Stripper's Bill of Rights. Peaches does. I think Peaches is your guys' new hero, right? Peaches with a mask. All right. <laughs> so the migrants who fall off the trains in Mexico and die exit the trains. Right? A lot of that happening. Or about the ones that get sold into whatever kind of slavery. I mean, you got a lot of migrants being picked off by Mexican authorities and the cartel and all these other agencies. I mean, who knows what's going on there, right? Who knows? Because I've seen story after story about families with kids not getting on the trains because number one, they're dangerous. And number two, they can easily get picked off by whatever predator is coming along and just really takes care of them. Yeah, once they find the men attractive too, protect those cheeks. Need a sign, no migrants allowed. Oh, you guys are getting in some deep stuff. Um, <laughs> no one was ever screened for firearms at this homeless shelter. Yeah. I mean, what's up with why? Okay. If, if any other event that has, you know, that many people being killed, you would have a metal detector at the front door, right? Wouldn't you have a metal detector? I mean, you got to have a metal detector to, to get into a damn sporting event now. Right. I go to the Kraken, Seattle Kraken, or I go to, um, you know, concert, I end up empty out all my pockets and uh, here's all my stuff. You know, I just want to go see a show. I just want to go see a show. I no, I'm not carrying a gun, but there's so many Looney Tunes out there. Why, when you've got known people that are mental, 
why wouldn't you screen for guns? Yeah. General Disarray, we've got a sign in your town that says three murders since 1952. Is that right? Wow. We've probably had that in Seattle in, uh, in March. When they find American women attractive, it is, is their fault. Yeah. Part of a conversation I clearly was not involved in. Um, <laughs> can you please talk about my commie prison of New York? <laughs> I talk about New York all the time. I, I don't know if that was meant for me, but yeah, I talk about New York all the time. Talked about, uh, oh, um, Cash Jordan had a video on uh, the shopping center, Fulton Shopping Center in New York City, and it's going down. A lot of stuff happening because people don't want to shop in areas where you know you got massive shoplifting going on and all that craziness. I'm going to scroll up a few more few more things here and see what else you guys have been um Homer fan, you use the F word, the F A R T. That's funny. Yeah, I I can't blame you on there. It's a good word. It's a good word. Illinois Governor Fred Flintstone is <laughs> is a pain. <laughs> Let's go Fred Flintstone. Yeah, so many of these these politicians now you associate with cartoon characters, right? Like Beetlejuice. She just she looked like Beetlejuice. There was no no question about it. Let's go Brandon Johnson's worse. Yeah. I'm I'm still I'm still trying to figure that out. I think uh Beetlejuice was more con- conniving. I don't think Brandon Johnson, I don't think his IQ is high enough to be conniving. I really don't. When, when I hear him talk, um, he, he just reminds me. He reminds me the way he talks and reads stuff. It's a little bit, it's a little bit like the mayor of New York, right? You're just like, okay, let's speed it up here. Uh, what are you doing? It, this, this isn't working. But that's kind of part and parcel of why he's doing such a bad job is they're just not great orators. They're not great at speaking. And they can't really read all that well. So... Uh, those losers that bum rushed the Texas border, trampled and injured some of the soldiers who were trying to keep them back. Yeah. Yeah. That was a big deal. That was horrible. That was terrible. And what, you know, what, what the right wing media thinks right now is that we're in for a bunch more of that. And now they've seen what they can do. All right. We can, we can rush border protection. Um, What's that going to mean for when you've got, instead of having a couple hundred people going across at these ports of entry, You've got thousands going through in a day. You had 4,000 go through Eagle Pass on December 20th, 2023. When you have those kind of numbers, you know, that was, that was what, a, a hundred or so, something like that. I, I don't remember the actual number that, that trampled border protection at, the, at El, El Paso. Um, but um, yeah, that is some of the concern. That is some of the fear that if you get, you know, four or 500 in a group, What's that going to look like? You're literally going to need all those National Guard that are there to, uh, to, to handle the scenario. It's absolutely insane. One more comment here. Which part of the word illegal do they not understand? Y- yeah. I mean, how is this? They, 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 they're not coming. They didn't walk across the bridge part. They, they swam across the, uh, the river, the Rio Grande. That makes them illegal. It, it, it's as simple as that. Now nah, they're... International workers, Sean. Uh huh. Well, I mean, yeah, they they are coming from another country. All right, that does make them international, but it doesn't make them legal. That's the bottom line. You're kind of diverting attention. It's like um, you know, signing in a strip club bill of rights so that you can slip in that booze. Or somebody was making the comment of it's like save the drowning puppies, but oh yeah, save the drowning puppies bill. But there's a you know there's a Big carve out for corporate, whatever, whatever. Oh, okay. We don't really care about the drowning puppies. We don't really, we don't, so much of this stuff is just ridiculous, right? Okay. I'm going to end with that. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. I will see you on the next one. Uh, Next live stream will be Tuesday, next Tuesday, 11 o'clock my time, but every morning, 9 a.m. my time. So noon, noon uh, East Coast time. I'm on the, uh, I'm on the premieres chat with me there. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks again for being here. Stay safe. And um, yeah, have a good one. Bye for now.